All right. Okay. Let's uh, let's start. Welcome. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, speak at this uh, conference. Uh, my name is uh, Thomas Malt, and this is uh, this is <laughs> Hey, obviously. Um, and for we come from a Norwegian co consultancy called uh, Know It, and. Uh, uh, previously, we worked like in, in several large uh, projects, and one of the things that uh, is like our common denominator when we started working together is that we've both struggled with how to get large development organization to scale, how to get the organization to work, and from a technical point of view, how to uh, have agile development with autonomous and self-driven teams. And uh, so we thought about doing a talk about it together. Mm -hmm. uh, previously, I worked at a Norwegian software company called Fronter, uh, which was used to be one of the two large uh, LMS or learning platform providers in uh, Norway. And I've also headed the technology and software development the department of NRK, the uh, Norwegian broadcaster. Um, OK. Yeah. So I started to code at 12, 68,000 assembler, Amiga. Anyone from the Amiga scene here? <laughs> ah, excellent, perfect. Uh, it's a long time ago, so <laughs> I don't code too much anymore. Now I do more architecture stuff and technology advisory for large customers. And I have, um, but I've been programming for lo loads of years. So um, I'm going to show you later some of my experience. Yeah. All right. So let's uh, let's start. So um, what we're trying to, to uh, talk about and, and have tried to solve for the last couple of years is, um, or what we're going to talk about is we're, we're going to start a little bit about the desired outcomes, what we want to achieve, and why with working with how you organize the teams. And the second topic is the importance of architecture. Um, um, Investing properly in, in architecture and, and a good uh, proficient um, solutions architecture uh, is one of the, like if you're building a bridge, a keystone, or uh, it's one of the catalysts or differentials, if you, if you will, if you were a, a car engine, that allows you to scale your organization efficiently. Without having a, a well thought out architecture, um, yeah, your teams will step it uh, on each other's sho sho um, shoes. You won't get a uh, uh, proper domain or areas of responsibility. And we'll talk more about this in that part. And the third part is the importance of investing in humans, the people on your teams, and your teams to have them work efficiently. And how investing in people's job satisfaction is one of the most crucial things to have an efficient and scalable uh, development organization. And then we're going to talk through some practical examples of how we've tried to organize this and why uh, to show you some examples. So the first topic is why. What, what are we trying to achieve? And for any organization having like stated goals for what you want to achieve is really, really important. And the same as when you exercise for a sporting event. Uh, you want to run the marathon or climb a mountain. Um, settling for being mediocre is very often not what you want to do. You want to set hairy, ambitious goals. I just remember this is an old Norwegian. Uh, never mind. Um, but yes, you have to set the big, hairy goals. And um, so. Um, and you want them to be to the point and measurable. So you, do, you, you can track how you improve and how, how, you, how you're doing uh, uh, in, the, in these areas. So the, f the first thing is that, um, and this is an example uh, from a previous organization when we worked on uh, what, what goal should we, we measure. And the first is to continuously increase the quality and efficacy, that means the efficiency or, and uh, the effectiveness of what you, uh, what you build. Um, we want to create the right things and we want to build them efficiently 
uh, and effectively. And the second uh, really important goal is to build great teams and organizations. We want to have teams that are fun to work in. Um, and we want to build uh, organizations that let people reach their full potential. And I'll talk more about why this is important for the over, overall effectiveness of your development effort. Uh, um, and lastly, we want to have teams that, where you can continuously learn and develop as a professional. And um, this is crucial to be able to build world-class products and solutions. Um, and you, you'd want to set goals that you want to be world-class. Um, because very often you won't reach th that exact goal, but you can work towards it. And having a, having, and it's important for pride and the willingness to put in in the, put in that extra twenty percent of effort. That yes, we want to be world class. We want to be proud of our product and what we want to do. Um, and you want to create uh, products that are stable, maintainable, and easy to manage. So why is architecture, be it solution system software or enterprise architecture, crucial to succeeding? Um, ah, interesting. Uh, the first thing is that having a good architectural documentation builds a map that uh, lets you have efficient navigation through your system. When you have a large complex system where multiple teams want to work together at the same time, um, you want to be able to understand how your small part fits into the whole. And you want to be able to uh, have um, patterns for how you can navigate between the different modules and understand how they work without digging into the details. Uh, this is much better solved with having shared architectural or, te uh, or solution patterns, design patterns in your code or in your systems, rather than minute and complex and complete documentation. So you want to build, to make the system as self-documenting as possible. How do you do that? By investing time in creating design patterns and solution patterns that you can reuse and that let uh, people navigate efficiently in that information domain. Um, the way a library is, uh, is organized is, uh, uh, is a typical and excellent example. Um, how if you are a CD or used to be a CD or record collector, how you discover that sorting your albums by color coding the covers is not the most efficient way to easily find the, the record you want to listen to. But having uh, sorting them alphabetically is a much more efficient pattern to let people navigate efficiently in your record collection. It's a very simple example, but it is the exact same um, um, practices you get into when you work with solution architecture and figure out how the different parts are going to fit together. Um, the second part is one of the main goals of working with software architecture is to reduce complexity. This is an actual, <laughs> this is a simplified version of an ac uh, actual dependency map uh, of uh, one of the software systems I worked with. It was used by more than 8 million people worldwide and it had consisted of a bunch of libraries and modules that had been, uh, had been worked on, inherited on, uh, implemented, uh, uh, on for, for a decade. And when you, when you drew out the dependency map, it looked like this. Um, and complexity of a system, uh, you have to know, grows um, exponentially. So uh, it's, uh, as with, uh, with slow exponential growth, seen in a short time scale, it looks linear. And the complexity creeps on you slowly, slowly, slowly. It's only when you zoom out and see the big time scale, you see how the exponential curve accelerates. So it's like the lobster being a hot uh, pot of water being boiled. It does not notice the incremental temperature uh, increases. It is after three or four years, you suddenly start to wonder, or your manager comes and asks, 
why has development crept to this glacier pace? Why aren't you implementing new features as quickly and efficiently as before? Why are you producing, introducing more and more bugs into your code? It is because you have let complexity creep up to the level where the code and systems are no longer maintainable. So one of the, the core goals in for agile autonomous teams to invest and spend time on software architecture, it's not to document very complex solutions, even though that is sometimes necessary. It is to have the practice to, uh, to continuously practice reducing the complexity and reducing the number of dependencies and connections between your systems and code. And this is why a modular or microservice architecture approach is a very sustainable uh, and or much more sustainable approach than uh, uh, an old school huge monolithic system. Um, yeah, so, um, so we're going to talk more about that uh, later. One of the core practices that uh, we talk about is with di distributed systems and cloud-based systems to have an API-centric approach uh, to let your components and modules uh, speak through well-defined APIs rather than um, ad hoc or independent integrations. Um, but the, the thing I want to close this part of the presentation on is a, a principle called Conway's Law. How many here have heard, heard about Conway's Law already? So about one third, half. It is, uh, uh, it is, uh, um, it's a, what's the right word for that? Some Maxim? No, something like that. But it is, it, it's a quote from uh, uh, um, Melvin Conway, who was, uh, um, he, who, uh, who was a researcher on, in, on uh, complex information systems in the 60s. And he noted that organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of the organization. So very often you see that the systems you create duplicate the way your organization works. So if you work in a messy organization with unclear uh, mandates and lines of responsibility, you end up creating a messy and organized system. If you work in a strictly hierarchical system where you only follow orders and you never do anything except you're getting an order, you create a very hierarchical and tightly controlled system that limits innovation. And the key point here is that you need to be conscious of these mechanisms, which leads us to another practice that uh, Jan Henrik and I talk about, which is the inverse Conway maneuver. And this means being very mindful of the responsibility of the teams and the modules that you want to create so that you adapt the organization uh, to a way of working which fits with the capabilities that you want to develop in the system you create. Which means that you want to develop a very well-defined domain model so that you know what one part of the system is supposed to do, what responsibilities it should have, and what features it should have, also which interfaces and how this module should communicate with other parts of the system. And then you have a team which let that uh, um, um, have a team that is responsible for that. And we'll talk more about later on the way you can organize governance and communication with the different teams in the same way that the modules have APIs to communicate, then you need to create a governance or communication structure for collaboration between your teams as well. But that is in the uh, next part of the talk. Okay. <clears throat> like this? Okay. So now I'm going to take you through a use, uh, not a use case, but a um, showcase. It's an actual real life example. Um, it's from the city of Oslo. And this is a research paper that's published uh, just this spring. Um, so this is, uh, this is this organizational chart of city of Oslo. It's a large employer. It's about 50,000 employees, I think. Um, lots of people, lots of bureaucracy. 
uh, really chaos. All these uh, different organizational units, they do their own stuff. They don't care too much about everyone else. Uh, so uh, in 2003, we started uh, making a <coughs> infrastructure for um, communicating. So it's a large ESB uh, to communicate across this and from the, uh, from the outside and in. And um, this is the story. So um, this uh, slide is about the development and process and organization. So you see the, uh, this is a timeline, starts in 2003, and this is today. And you can see the blue um, chart here. It says number of components. And with this, it means a component is like a, a service or a microservice. We started with microservices about here, but a component, think of it as a service. So today we have about 300 components. And here then is about 150. And it, it's several million lines of code, at least now. And uh, the number of developers, it also scaled. That's the yellow line. So it scales from just me here, 2003. And today it's six, about 60. I think there's even more now, uh, more than like 100, actually, because it goes like whew, way up. In we started with no process. You don't need a process if, if I'm the only guy doing work. <laughs> I have my own process. We started with DevOps. Um, people here know DevOps? Yeah, I don't have to explain DevOps. This just means that the developer also do the operation, or uh, at least have the same responsibility. Uh, we just had one team in 2010, and let's skip the bimodal stuff. That's just the way of the, for the organization to work in different modes. So it works uh, really agile one place and more waterfall-ish another place in the organization. This is because it <coughs> lots of money come from a big initiative here. So I think about half, an, what's it in English, billion? Million? Yeah, billion. Half a billion was uh, pushed into the program and then they had to have more control. And that's why. We, we ran B model, didn't work too well. So that's why we now, in 2018, are working with autonomous teams. And I'm going, going to go into what an autonomous team is, but it means that one team has the full responsibility for everything. It means that they can make decisions that have um, economic consequence inside the team. And that's really important. It's not just a developer team. It's a team with business owners. I'll come back to that later. So this is the journey from 2003 um, until 2018. This is the uh, main architecture. Started with a big monolith, an application server. We went to microservices. And microservices, when it gets big, it doesn't scale. So we had to do something. So what's the challenges with scaling micro microservices architectures? Well, one of the things is that the code base becomes too large. Uh, you don't have any control of anything. It's like, OK, I have to change this, but I don't know who's responsible and who's done, who's done this. We had to make, uh, I think we made a script that was called who knows anything about this dot sh. And it just goes through the git log and checks, OK, who has the most commits on that code? <laughs> and the people, and the person that came up on top, he was known to poke on the shoulder. What, what can I do here? And that's not a, <coughs> it's not a really nice way to, <laughs> to organize. <laughs> so that's one thing. <clears throat> the other thing that happens what, uh, is that we, we had feature teams, but we didn't, we didn't align the architecture or the the microservices with the features. So here, if, you, if you're implementing feature one, you have to go into that microservice and that microservice. And maybe you never, when you don't know anything about that microservice, it's another team that has it. So this becomes really, really dangerous because the, the developer, he almost always just makes the, 
the thing again. So it just duplicates the code, or does it is his own way. So the problem is that it doesn't fit the architecture. So that's why we came up with this. This is the closest you get to code in slides here, <laughs> arrows and boxes. I'm going to explain a little bit about, about this one. So this is the reference architecture for the city of Oslo now. Um, let's start with the domain concept. This concept is, um, you can call it a business domain to, be, to make it simple. It could be HR in the city of Oslo. So everything inside this domain has something to do with HR. It has a well-defined API so that everyone that should can communicate with the HR domain has to go through this API. Team A is responsible for this domain. Uh, because of practical reasons, they are also responsible for another domain that could be anything like uh, uh, AIM infrastructure, something like that. Okay, let's say, uh, and within this domain, they have more or less full freedom. They can choose technology. Uh, they can have a message broker if that's what they need, but they don't have to have a message broker. Um, they can put this on another uh, platform, cloud platform. Let's say this team here, uh, they, they know AWS, so they can put the stuff on here. Uh, the thing is that if you, if you uh, should call another component here that needs something here, they have to go through this API. That's really important. Well-defined domains. And this scales to whatever you like. That's the, that's the main idea. Okay. So, we did um, a lot of research on this and found um, a lot of interviews and found that we had some problems or implications for practice. It's not a problem, but it's, this is important stuff. You have to find the right type of domain. So what's the, what's the different types of domains here? I told you HR, that could be a business domain, that's one type. But you also have, maybe one domain has totally different uh, SLA um, requirements. Like it has to be 24-7 up and has to have a really fast response time. That's a, that's a different way of doing stuff. And this, this might be just the backend service that has events flowing through to it. So that, that could be a non-functional requirement difference between the domains. And the third uh, third type of domain is uh, mapping it directly to an organizational unit, like the Vanden Avløpsetaten in English. Water supply uh, organizational unit stuff. I have a quick question. Yeah. I'm just falling out here. Okay. Um, is, this, is this about, like, is this an abstraction layer for developers, including, like, business people, whatever? Or is this just a domain that could be like an it's instance uh, of pretty much everything? Yeah, it's, it's a, virtu a, a virtual it's a domain. Virtual whatever. Yeah, whatever. It's it could whatever. be one of those it's three a things. It's, a, a it's not a container. It's a logical thing. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So you just, you just put, uh, you're responsible for a set of components in your domain. So yeah, the team is yeah. mapped to the domain. It doesn't have to be software. No. Right. So these are, these are microservices. These are so this is software. This is software. Yeah. Okay. And the API here is uh, also a software component. Okay. I thought you were m mapping the software model into like updating or, you know. Updating it? Yeah. No, you could do that. Yeah, I was wondering because yeah. you were juggling with the with the 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 item terms like run and envelopes. It sounded okay. like you were yeah. but that, that's one departments or something, yeah. you know? Yeah. But you you okay. can do that. That's Sometimes that's a natural thing to do. You map the domain to the updating or organizational yeah, unit. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay. So you're talking about software all okay. the time. All right, thanks. Okay, okay thanks. thanks. Uh, one other thing is to modify the service boundaries. These are the service boundaries. Uh, you probably heard of domain-driven design. Uh, this is basically the same thing, but it's abstracted up. So 
the service boundaries are here. And the thing is that this changes everything. When you change the organization, you do like you <coughs> you ch you move responsibility from one organizational unit to another one. You have to also think about changing the the domain boundaries, maybe move some components and so so forth. And the last point, implementing API versioning and management, because this has to be stable. This API has to be stable for this these guys to to use it. So this is a stable API, and this is full freedom. You can do whatever you want here because it doesn't. How can it be stable if you move all the components? Because the API is external. This is the only external API, and these are team specific. Mm -hmm. You see? Not so. Because Not so. If, you're, if you move out a component with a, which, which represents if you if you move this component, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you move this component here, yeah. and you you need this from here, maybe. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have to evolve the API. Right? But yeah. it has to be, it has to be, well, stable it's is probably the wrong word, but it has to be, what do you call it? Uh, version control. Version control, yeah. at least, yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is the conclusion for the, for the paper. Um, the thing is that if you do an API-centric architecture like this, uh, it enables autonomy. So the teams become more autonomous, and hence it gets more speed. It can deliver without being dependent of everyone else. OK, but you have, let's look at the time, OK. Um, you have to have some governance into this. Uh, because I told you that the teams have full freedom. Of course, they don't have all the freedom. It can't be chaotic. But we have to put the standards and the governance on the right level. So this, these are examples of um, the governance that we put in place. Uh, we say that everything is open source, at least open source internally in the organization, so that everyone has to, can see other people's codes. But they don't get to deploy the code, because the code are owned by the team. And that's important. So the team has to check, check the code before it goes into production. But you, you can use an open source model, like you can make a pull request at GitHub. So that's the governance. We also demand API management, so we knows who, know who's using the API uh, always. No open APIs. They're open, but you have to have a token so we know who you are. And that's to have control of the version versioning. Also, we have a centralized way of doing authentication and authorization. And that's, that's the one central service that's used. <coughs> the things that we don't govern is uh, things like uh, what tools should the teams use. We don't care about if they use that ID or that ID. Or what process do they use, if they use Scrum or Kanban. The open source is that within the domain, or is it uh, across? Right now, it's domain? within the domain, yeah. uh, or within the organization. But uh, it's a plan that we're putting everything on GitHub open to the world yeah. soon. OK? All right, so that's it. Um, to be able to succeed with this, you have to get a couple of things in place. Um, the first thing is that you have to give the teams the proper amount of responsibility and build like the sense of responsibility. In Norwegian, we have this term ansvarskompetanse, which I find hard to uh, translate. Which is, but it, it's the ability to take responsibility and understand what being responsibility mean uh, in your organization. So to really have autonomous team, uh, teams, you want them to have all the capabilities and abilities they need to succeed. Uh, clicker. Yeah. This is not a clicker. <laughs> um, they have to have all the competences on the team they need to succeed. 
and they have to uh, be both allowed and willing to make decisions. And that is something that has to be trained and exercised for. It doesn't happen by itself. So one of the first practices I would encourage is to put architectural responsibility for their domain on the team. They are responsible for creating and suggesting the architecture and building that architecture. Um, but to succeed with this, you need to have a working governance structure for the teams. A way for them to communicate, uh, discuss and make decisions. And if you are the manager or leader of this department, you want to host it, then you need to have the strength both to always listen to the best argument, but also never to be afraid to make a decision when it's necessary. So in nine out of 10 times, a team of experts will agree on the best possible solution because they all want to find the best possible solution. But once in a while, you'll have a stalemate on the teams and you have to have this like this democratic sense of not being a dictator, but facilitate the best uh, decision and sometimes cut through uh, the crap in, in case of a stalemate. So you have to build this working governance structure and have it in place. So this is not an example of a typical uh, line organization with an architecture or enterprise architecture group on top. This is an example of uh, a team or a, a set of teams with three clear and well-defined product areas and uh, five independent development teams uh, at, uh, in, within the same product area. So this is, a, this is an abstract model or a, a generalized model, but it's actually the team structure we created when I worked at or when we did this together at, uh, at NRK. Uh, so basically, this can be thought of as NRK's radio and TV streaming services, um, NRK's uh, apps and services for kids and youth, and NRK's services for uh, web pages and news and uh, news services, that kind of stuff. Um, so what we did is that um, the people with the red hats are tech leads. The, they are given architecture responsibility they have like they could be seen as the solutions architects or software architects on the teams um, and but they are they are custodians of the best practices and the way the teams implement their technical solutions and they are important um, facilitators for discussions with ux and product owners on how to build and solve something in the technical and architectural sense so they get together at a regular basis and communicates in the tech leads council or the architectural council where the CTO or the head of development or head of architecture, chief architect, chief developer, what you call it, also sits and have like a double vote. If this group can't agree on best practices and can't, like say, we, we, we clearly don't agree, that person have the clear mandate to say, listen, I've heard all the arguments, this is the best decision now and this is what we're going to do. But in nine in 10 cases, a group of experts will, um, will agree on the best possible approach uh, because they listen to common sense. And you need this kind of communication form or arena, if you like, between the different teams where they can present their architecture, present their solutions and uh, flesh out how this, uh, these things are uh, going to work together. The way we did it at uh, Frontier when we put uh, a very similar organization in place was that every week we had an architecture council. And the first half hour was, uh, um, was uh, two lightning talk presentations, or so, sorry, like oh, probably the first hour, but was two lightning talks presentation. So each team on a round robin basis presented the state of the argument and suggested solution for 15 to 20 minutes. And then it was 10 to 15 minutes peer review, critical questions, criticism, uh, curious questions, just agreements how this uh, uh, were supposed to work together. And then the next hour was alignment, like how does this fit into the bigger picture? What kind of changes or updates to directions, either on the team having presented 
or on the other teams do we need to make to uh, make this fit? What are the different needs we have on the teams? Sometimes uh, a need for a new component that we haven't thought of or a new API endpoint uh, would come up and on which team does this belong? Do we need to create a separate team for this? All these things were part of the architectural governance or technical government governance structure. Um, one of the ways to succeed with this is to really work hard to value teams and people for real. Um, what this means is that uh, having uh, investing in professional development is not a waste of, on, uh, of time, even if you're in a development organization with a tight budget and a tight deadline. Of course, sometimes like reality is reality and you really need to crunch to meet the deadline or there is outside factors that, uh, um, that uh, forces you to adjust your approach. But generally, re like really investing in having people thrive and giving them the best opportunity that you can to succeed is crucial on your teams. And then also working uh, continuously to figure out what kind of competencies your teams need to strengthen, what kind of people you need to recruit to strengthen your teams and have well-balanced teams is really crucial. Um, one of the very common anti-patterns I've seen is uh, that it, an organization will traditionally have a separate software development and operations uh, or, and, uh, and or maintenance department. They will be in separate departments, separate leaders, separate divisions even. Um, and one part, the operations or maintenance department is uh, measured on cost reduction. So their, the, their leader is measured on how much, they can how much money on hosting and operations they can save. While the software development department is measured on innovation, being able to create a new cool product for kids or schools or something else or uh, the municipality of Oslo and bring that to, um, to the, the public. Um, so, and this is a real life example when we try to make this case for the, uh, the leader group of, of the National uh, Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation where we had this exact issue. And here operations were put together with uh, facility management and uh, um, Cantina Drift. And um, they, we had, when we measured, we had one third of the operations people we needed to have proper DevOps or proper management and proper lifecycle management of our products. So we made this simplified uh, model where we said that for our teams to be scalable, to be able to actually scale up our organization, we need to have one sysadmin, one operations uh, resource, IT operations resource for every four developer. And for every four developer on the team, we need to have a tech lead or architect on the team. And we need to have uh, a UX interaction designer or visual designer on the team. Um, and the different color bubbles in this model, by the way, is to take into account the, um, that uh, a lot of, uh, lot of uh, professionals have different competency areas. So a really proficient backend developer can also be an excellent mobile or iOS or Android developer, uh, similar with front and back end, similar with back end uh, test QA or DevOps uh, engineer, and so on and so forth. And uh, the, here, here is the UX and uh, interaction designer, and uh, you'll see a tech lead bubble under here, the same is there. So there might be like, this does not mean positions on the team, uh, it is roles and responsibility on the teams that you have to have in place to have a well-balanced team. And the rule of thumb that we created then was a team must be able to take responsibility for product planning and prioritization. They should have a product owner on the team. They should be allowed to make full decision on their product or service, what they are creating. They should be able to do product design and user experience within the team and make all decisions and have people on the team who 
are fully up to date on the needs and requirements of the users and of the product. They need to be able to make all solutions architecture and technical implementation on the team. They need to have the competency to do proper testing and quality assurance and so on with deployment, uh, maintenance, operations and product lifecycle. So when you have a, a growing organization, so when you grow through 10 or 20 people, um, it starts to get hard to, to talk to everyone all the time and synchronize over the, the, the water cooler or coffee machine. Um, when you grow through 50, 60, 70, you, you stop knowing everyone in the organization. You don't know who they are. And you, you start to be socially awkward to one another because you don't know what do you, I don't know who you are. Uh, and as you grow through, through hundreds, these problems will continue to increase in complexity. So uh, you need to have a governance structure to collaborate and share knowledge uh, and experiences. Uh, you need to build a strong competency and knowledge sharing groups. So this is also a real life example of the competency groups we created at NRK. Uh, and also at, uh, at the front, we did a, a very similar uh, model. And um, the point here is that this is not a set of uh, these exact competency groups. You should create competency groups for the areas that are strategically important for your company, what you're actually working with, what are the areas of proficiency in your company. But if you want to succeed with ren like renewal and innovation and have new ideas, you should keep your competency groups open. So your people should be encouraged to create new ad hoc or new competency groups and areas of interest when they discover new technology or something that is interesting. Especially if you're a leader, this is my strong recommendation, that you won't always understand what is beneficial or useful for your company until much later on, until uh, a year later you'll understand, oh, this IoT things they were working on, this is actually really useful, you know, that this is something we can do. Uh, same thing is that, oh, this modern API-centric or, um, or uh, cloud, uh, uh, cloud services competency group, that was really useful for us. Now we have a head start getting uh, going in this area. So this will help coordina uh, coordination, um, cohesion, and your governance across the, across the teams. Um, as a leader, you need to make sure that these groups also have a clear responsibility and clear mandate for what they are supposed to do. And uh, you, my personal opinion is that you'll succeed easier if you had like well-defined like heads of competency in place. Somebody is the head of front-end competency. Someone is the head of user experience, uh, uh, so on and so forth, to have somebody to talk to and uh, to avoid the possibility that you know, someone should do this. Yes, and you are the head of that area, so that's your responsibility. Uh, but they should also have the, f uh, should have the freedom to meet whenever they need. Um, and there should be like, a clear expectation from you and from like, your college. Actually, this should be part of your culture building. Uh, a clear expectation for quality and format of the g gatherings. You should, you should work very hard to avoid a culture where it's okay to sit there and goof off two hours without doing anything. So you should have expectations to have lightning talks and presentations that have a certain level of quality. That bar should be low, but the, the bar or the, the culture should always be to work towards raising that bar. So if you did the presentation two weeks ago, then you're allowed to repeat some kind of iteration over that same talk or that architecture or that technical problem. But you should see that the average quality of presentations and talks in your organization should continuously increase. And so this is where the, the leader as a, a coach and mentor and somebody who is a, a cultural uh, for the builder. Um, I know, like role, model. role model, exactly, becomes uh, much more important than being a leader that makes decisions, you should be a leader that is a role model. 
that uh, encourages and coaches the kind of attitudes and professional mentality that you, that you want to build in your organization. And you should work towards like getting uh, common guidelines and best practices from these competency groups. But always avoid like force feeding this to people. Like people are highly intelligent. Oh, is this possible? So um, being responsible, the ability to be responsible, it, it must be taught and practiced. Somebody have this uh, um, within themselves. Others have to be explained or, or actually like through their life experience have to understand slowly what it means. Ah, being responsible actually mean figuring out what the other teams need and talk to them about it and agree with them on the best approach. It's not just sitting here doing our own thing. Uh, that, uh, that thing needs to be like curated and built over time in your organization. And that leads us to the, the last talking point, which is to make job uh, satisfaction a top priority uh, in your company. So I like to talk to this. This is like a canary in the coal mine type of metric, actually measuring, tracking job satisfaction and, and how they thrive at work. Um, because um, at like high competency, um, um, our work that requires high levels of autonomy and competency uh, to succeed, people are very often self-motivated with the love of their profession and what they do. And if they feel that something is sluggish or not working properly in the company, being unnecessary bottlenecks, unnecessary bureaucracy, an inefficient or obsolete technical platform, this will be very visible in their job satisfaction surveys. And having questions and goals like, are you allowed to reach your full potential in the work? Like, do you see a way you can reach your full potential? Uh, are we working out? No, th this is actually, I'm jumping the gun. This is your part. So what's the time? Is it? You have five, five minutes left. Five minutes left. Well, five minutes. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll do this. Okay, we'll do this really quick. <laughs> this is going to go fast. It's just an example. The thing is that <clears throat> this is also a real life example from the city of Oslo. We have uh, teams over here. So this is one team, this is another team. And we do surveys. So uh, once half a year, I think, uh, we check if uh, this team is, uh, does it have a product owner that works? Uh, can you influence your work? How, the level of autonomy in the team are you satisfied? And that's, this is really important because this, this is actually a traffic light thing that I can show the leaders. They understand the colors. That's perfect. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, two main points to remember from this talk. A well-crafted architecture is fundamental to success. An API-centric approach uh, is what we recommend when scaling, especially microservices. And think about the organization mapping to the architecture and vice versa. And the last point, humans and teams are your most valuable assets, especially these kind of guys that are doing software development. Smart, smart guys. OK. Thank you. No time for questions, but we can, we can stay right here yeah. if you want to talk to us.